You have a linear system of equations. So a matrix A times a vector X equals a vector B. And you have an algorithm to solve for X. This can be relevant, for instance, when you discretize partial differential equations, but also arises in a lot of other settings. Then once you have the solution vector X, you plug this into a scalar valued loss function J. This can, for instance, be comparing the solution of your simulation by the PDE with some measurements that you've taken in the real world. Now you know that your system matrix and the right hand side depend on some parameters, let's call this theta, and they are a bunch of them, so it's a theta vector. So you have A of theta times X equals B of theta. And now it would be interesting to know how this loss function changes with respect to theta, which is the gradient of J with respect to the theta vector. And this can, for instance, be used in some gradient-based optimization to tune the parameters or also to look at local sensitivities. But the question is, how can we obtain the gradient? And one particularly efficient method that we want to look at in this video is called the adjoint, and it's the adjoint for a linear system of equations that we are going to investigate here. Hi and welcome to this new video. The agenda is that we will first look a little more closely at the problem of finding this gradient. Then we try to derive a naive approach from which we can then find the clever adjoint approach which we will discuss in detail. Let me put some more context on what we had in the introduction. So we have some dependency of our system matrix and the right hand side on the theta vector. And let's say this theta vector that we have here is a p-dimensional vector. You can also think of p as parameters. So it is just a collection of parameters. You can also think of it in the following way. Since we use theta for both A and B, that A depends on the first half of the entries in theta and B depends on the second half of it. It's just like collecting them in one vector. And also as said in the intro, this can, for instance, be parameters when discretizing a PDE. A classical example would be constitutive parameters. These arise when you model certain properties of materials. So they arise when discretizing PDEs. They should not arise with discretization, but they arise in the modeling stage. But it can also be something that is more related to machine learning. It could be weights of a neural network. So for instance, maybe you have a neural network that sets up your system matrix or your right-hand side. So this, of course, depends on some parameters. And if you're familiar with neural networks, then you might know automatic differentiation. So a way to really efficiently get gradients, but this only works, or the classical sense of automatic differentiation, only works for explicitly given relations. And here, our relation is implicitly given because it requires the solution of a linear system. So it is implicitly given. Well, you could now might argue that if I want to use automatic differentiation, then I will just differentiate through the solution mechanisms. So for instance, if you use LU decomposition or if you use some iterative solver. However, this can become really impractical for a lot of real world scenarios. So other methods like the adjoint method that we will present in this video, is more reasonable to use in these scenarios. Okay, now we've looked at the dimensionality of the parameters. Let us also note down the dimensionality of the three apparent variables here. So we have an A, which is an n by n dimensional matrix. Then we have an X, which is an n dimensional vector. And you have a B, which is another n-dimensional vector. So we have a square system matrix. And then we also introduced a loss function. So we have some, and that's important, it's scalar valued loss function. And this loss function was j, it depends on x. And here it could also depend on the parameter vector theta additionally. So then we would might use the first 20% of the 
theta values for the A matrix, then another 20% for the B vector, and then the rest for the loss metric. So it's kind of flexible, but it also does not have to depend on any parameters. However, the important fact is that it is scalar valued. So you also see this because I don't use any underscore here. And in the intro I said, a classical example would be comparing your solution against the measurements, but this can also be just like a super simple quadratic loss. So we can have some quadratic loss for which we take some sort of like a scalar product. So we say that j of vector x and the parameter vector theta is just x transpose and then some matrix q x. And now you could say whether q is fixed or q is part of the parameters that's kind of dependent on your modeling scenario. However, this will reduce to a scalar value, which is some sort of all loss function that we want to find the gradient of. And before we start with the derivation, let me make some really important remark. So the fact that our system of equations where the system matrix A depends on theta and B depends on theta is yielding the solution X. The solution then of course also depends on theta. So the fact since A is a function of theta and B too, we know that X will be also a function of theta. That is, of course, because the solution changes dependent on the parameter theta. With this in mind, let us find an expression for the gradient of the loss function with respect to the theta parameters. So we want to derive j with respect to theta. And the important fact here is that we want to take the total derivative. So we are interested in all the derivatives with respect to nested dependencies. So we can see that our loss function depends explicitly on x and theta, and we know due to the fact that x is also a function of theta, there is also an implicit dependency on theta due to the fact that we have x as an argument. So in essence, applying the total derivative, let us first take the partial derivative with respect to theta, so this is just for the explicit dependency, and then we take the partial derivative of j with respect to x, so that we can then take the total derivative of x with respect to theta. And here we apply the chain rule because we have j with respect to x times x with respect to theta. So the last derivative is a Jacobian because we derive a vector valued function x with respect to its argument theta. So this one will be a matrix of size n by p. So it will have n rows and p columns. And the dimension of j with respect to x will be r1 by n. So it will be a row vector with one row and n columns. But now you might ask yourself, isn't the gradient usually a column vector? That is the thing that you're usually taught when you learn first about multivariate calculus. However, here it is helpful to define it as a row vector because we make extensive usage of the multivariate chain rule. And if it was a column vector, then it would be like n by one. These dimensionalities wouldn't match up. So we can't just use matrix multiplication here. So we would have to account for this differently. So note that here, and this can be inconsistent with other of my videos, and this depends on the fact that this usually is different in different application scenarios, that the gradient is a row vector. And the reason for that is that it helps with the multivariate chain rule, the multivariate chain rule that we will be using here or that we already used. Okay, with this knowledge in mind, we can also clarify the dimensionalities here. So this one will then also be a row vector with one by p. And here we have another row vector, which is one by p. And then we see the dimensionalities match. If we make a matrix multiplication here, n cancels and we have a one by p. So after this total derivative, we are left with a quantity that is quite difficult to evaluate. And that's this quantity here. So it is the difficult one. And why is it difficult? Because it is the total derivative of the solution with respect to theta. And if you are familiar with automatic differentiation and x was given explicitly, so maybe just as a function, like a component-wise addition with something or so, then you could just like propagate this derivative even further by applying the rules for the total derivative. However, here it is implicitly given. So how can we express it? And the idea is that we want to find 
an expression for dx by d theta by implicitly deriving the original linear system of equations. So let me note this down. What we will be doing now is implicitly deriving the linear system of equations. And let me remind you that a depends on theta, b depends on theta, and due to the fact that x is the solution to this linear system, x also depends on theta. And we want to derive this in a form that we do d by d theta on both sides of the equation. There are some limitations on this, whether you are allowed to do this or not, which are governed by the implicit function theorem. However, here we assume that everything works out and we can just go further with our implicit derivation. So what we will be doing is we will take the derivative with respect to the theta vector on a x and I also drop the dependency on theta but we will keep them in mind and then on the right side d by d theta applied to the vector b. So let's do the product rule because a and x depend on theta so we get d a by d theta times x plus a times dx by d theta equals and here we just have db by d theta. And here by the implicit derivation, we see the quantity that we want to plug in. So here we need the dx by d theta, and you can see it here. So we can just rearrange for it and plug it in. So let me first bring this on the right hand side of the equation. So we get a times dx by d theta is db by d theta minus dA by d theta times x and then we can apply the inverse in order to get dx by d theta standing alone so we will have dx by d theta is a inverse times db by d theta minus dA by d theta times x and then closing brackets and just a remark that I usually do in these kind of videos that this a inverse or usually the inverse in general is uh, just a concept so don't think of it as you have to explicitly calculate the inverse we will later on see that this is just like helpful for the derivation okay let's look at the dimensionalities once again so we know that the x by d theta will be n by p then a inverse will have the same dimensionality as n by itself will be n by n, then db by d theta will be n by p, and here we will have a derivative of a matrix with respect to a vector, so this will be an n by n by p, and this one, the x, is of course our n-dimensional column vector. So we see that if we multiply the inverse with the first term, we get our n by p. However, here we see there is like a dimensionality mismatch. I will put a note here that what we do here is incorrect but I think it's okay to have it like incorrect here because it's usually difficult to take derivatives of matrices with respect to vectors or even matrices usually this doesn't work in the symbolic notation and you have to use some index notation that I don't want to do here but just think of it that this would match up that this would somehow be multiplying into an n by p dimensional matrix so that we can then multiply with the inverse to get again n by p. So I would say this is incorrect but it's okay for the concept because the big concept of the adjoint doesn't change to the, just because the dimensionalities don't match here. Well and now we found an expression for this dx by d theta. So we could solve this problem here. So maybe we have to use some linear equation solvers again, and then we get the, the x by the theta, and then we can plug this into the expression that we found for the dj by the theta, and then we have the gradient. But it's not that easy. So if you compare this form, which is the implicit form, with the linear system of equations in the beginning, we had a matrix times a vector equals a vector. So that's a classical linear system of equations. However, here we have a matrix times another matrix. So this is an n by p dimensional matrix that we want to solve for equals a matrix. You can, for instance, view this as a batched linear system of equations. You do not only want to solve for one vector, but you want to solve for p vectors at the same time. 
with p being the number of parameters that you have. You can also frame it in the following way, saying that this requires a linear solve, and by linear solve I just mean a call to the usually same algorithm which you would also solve this linear equation with, and we need this for each d x by d theta i. So for, for all of the rows in this Jacobian here, and if we have a lot of rows in the Jacobian, so in other words, if we have a lot of parameters, this become infeasible. So also in total, so hence for the total Jacobian, so dx by d theta, we would need p linear solves. And just to give you some perspective, if you have a dense matrix, you might use um, an LU decomposition or a QR decomposition. And with these algorithms, they have a runtime that is n to the power of three. So they depend on the number of parameters cubed. So let's say if a linear solve takes O to the n of power three, then this scales as O to the P times n to the power of 3. And that makes it linear in P. And that's problematic because usually the solution of this linear system is the biggest effort in a simulation pipeline or for whatever applications you want to use a linear system for. And now you have to do this P times. And if you have a lot of parameters, so think for instance your model involves a complicated neural network with 100,000 parameters, you need to do this 100,000 times. And if you solve a reasonably big system, for instance, in computational fluid dynamics, where a solution might take a week on a supercomputer, then it now takes a hundred thousand weeks on a supercomputer, and that's infeasible. So it is bad for peace being way greater than one. So maybe if you have five or ten, this can still be worthwhile, but if it goes beyond that, you might want to look for a different solution. And that's where the adjoint method comes in. So the remedy is the adjoint method. But Long story short, how do we get this adjoint method? And for this, well, we just take what we found here and plug this in. So we plug the dx by d theta into dj by d theta. So let's go back up here. How did this work? So we had the dj by d theta, then we did a total derivative, and now we found an expression for this Jacobian here. So let's just plug it in. So we want to have dj by d theta, that's the ultimate goal. And for this, we have the partial j by d theta, which only accounts for the explicit dependency. Then we have the partial j with respect to x. And then we have the expression that we found here with the a inverse. So let me plug this in. So we have an a inverse opening bracket, and then let's copy this again. So we have a db by d theta, in the total sense, minus a dA by d theta in the total sense times x. And then we again remind ourselves of the problem. So this would require p solves to get our Jacobian, which was our n by p. However, we see that the gradient that we want to have here is only one by p. So it is just a row vector, or in other words, it's just a vector. So it's not a matrix. And why is that? Because we then multiply this Jacobian matrix with this row vector here. So in other words, it is then contracted. So it is then contracted into a row vector. So that's because if we left multiply a row vector, which is the gradient that we have here with a matrix, we get another row vector. And the point that I want to try form here is, we put a lot of emphasis in saying that we need the full Jacobian, so we need these p-solves. And then we contract it into a row vector. So the question is, did we really need all these p-solutions of the linear system? Or is actually just one solution fine because we contract it in the end? And that's the key point of the adjoint. We will just use some clever bracketing. So we use some clever bracketing. And let me propose this bracketing, and then we will investigate it. So we keep the dj by d theta in a total sense. That's what we want to have. That's our gradient, our sensitivity, what we need for downstream applications. It was given as partial j, partial theta, plus. And now I want to bracket this multiplication of a row vector with the matrix inverse. So dj by dx times a inverse 
into a bracket and then multiply it with db by d theta minus da by d theta times x. And again, this will not work in the dimensionalities, but let's think it will work. And the interesting aspect is that we can do this multiplication before we do the multiplication with this one here. And then here we see that it requires the inverse of a matrix. And whenever we see an inverse of a matrix, we have to think of solutions to linear equations. So in a dense sense, something that scales n cubed. But here we only do it with a vector. So we have a similar problem to our initial implicitly given x, which is matrix A times vector x. And here it just looks a little differently. But here we again have a matrix and a vector. So we have a similar problem to before. And the quantity that is the solution of this multiplication, I will define this as a lambda and it's a vector, but it's a transpose vector because it is a row vector. So that's because we have a row vector, which is the gradient, times a matrix yields a row vector and we want to define lambda as a column vector. So we need to transpose it in order to have it as a row vector. And the key point is that we solve or lambda once, and that's the point, once, and we do this up front. We do this before the calculation of anything further. So in essence, we have the definition, lambda transpose is dj by dx times a inverse. We can rearrange this a bit, so multiplied by a from the right side. So we have lambda transpose times a is dj by dx and it also now looks more like a linear system and if we now apply the transpose on both sides of the equation so then we have i will just do this explicitly so lambda transpose times a in brackets transpose is dj by dx transpose and then the transposition changes the order so we have then an a transpose times a lambda is dj by dx transpose and we have another linear system which uses the same system matrix as before, just in a transpose sense. And if we have the A matrix available, then we also have the transpose of it available. And if we have an algorithm to solve a linear system, then we also have an algorithm to solve this linear system. And we see that this system is of a similar complexity as the one before. That is because since A is an n by n matrix, A transpose, will also be an n by n matrix. Then lambda will be an n-dimensional vector. And if we take the derivative of our scalar loss with respect to x, which was n-dimensional, we're getting a row vector of size one by n. And if we then apply the transposition, we get a column vector of n, and then the system matches again. And this quantity lambda that we introduced is the adjoint variable. So lambda is rn, that's the adjoint variable and it also gives name to the adjoint method and it's important that it has the same dimension as x which was the original solution to our system of equation i want to add one more remark here maybe just in case you're confused why we need the transpose here again um, because um, the gradient is a row vector i don't want to be religious about this so just here in this um, derivation because it helped us. Okay, so now it's still not fully clear on how to get to our ultimate goal, the gradient. So let's just put up a strategy. So the strategy for dj by d theta. So what do we have to do for this? So first we solve forward and by solving forward is we just solve our original system of linear equations, which we would do in the first place because we want to have the solution x anyways. So we solve this for x with our linear solver. Then we solve the adjoint. You can also call this a backward solve, which will be the solution a transpose times lambda is dj by dx in brackets transpose. And we solve this for lambda. And then we can go to step three, which is how to get a dj by d theta. And here we just plug it in. So step three. So let me also move this a little bit down so that uh, now I can call this plug in. And then we get dj by d theta in the total sense is the partial j by theta. 
which can be zero in a lot of applications, plus lambda transpose, and that's the lambda from here, times db by d theta minus dA by d theta and times x. And the x we plug in here is the x from here. And again, let me remind you that this is not correct in the symbolic notation here, but assume it worse. Usually you have to use index notation for this. And the really important finding, let me highlight it once again, in order to get the dj by d theta, which was our ultimate goal, we only need two solves of the linear system. So we do the forward solve and the backward solve. And if you have some exposure to automatic differentiation, you might see the similarity between the reverse mode differentiation and the adjoint method that we have here. Because in the reverse mode differentiation, you also have to do a forward pass first, then you have to save all intermediary values, and then you do a backward pass. And in the end, you then assimilate all the gradients at each of the points in the computational graph. So there are some similarities between, which we also will investigate in a further video. And also some remarks on when to use the adjoint method. Usually the adjoint method is usable if you have maybe more than 10 parameters and the solution of your linear system is expensive. So like speaking of computational fluid dynamics, simulations running a day or a week, or maybe even a couple of hours, and then it's worthwhile to investigate the adjoint method. If And if your simulation or your application scenario is just a small one, takes 10 seconds or so, and you only have a handful of parameters, five or so, then you can also use the naive approach, then using adjoint might be an overhead. But for a lot of applications, using the adjoint method can be really advantageous. There might be one question left in your mind. So we have a way to get total dj by d theta, but this involves other partial derivatives. This involves this partial derivative, this one, and two more total derivatives. So how do we get these derivatives? So how to get the other derivatives? So um, being concrete, we want to have the partial j, partial x. We need the partial j, partial theta. We need the total b, total theta. And we need the total a, total theta. And I want to make the claim that these are simple. And by simple, I mean they are simpler than what we have here. Because in a usual scenarios, um, the j is explicitly given. So you plug in an x and you get a j. So there is no linear system that you have to solve. Same for the dj by the theta. Here, there could be one involved, but usually isn't. So for instance, if you model this A and B by neural networks, then neural networks are just explicit forward propagating operations. So you can then either use AD, so automatic differentiation, automatic differentiation, differentiation, which you would use for neural networks anyways, or if they are extremely simple, you can also do this analytically. And also one outlook, if you have somehow nested linear systems for whatever reason or for whatever modeling scenario, you can also chain this. So you can solve like adjoint problems backwards, which we will also cover in another video. And with this, I hopefully answered the question how to get all the ingredients for the adjoint method. If there is still something unclear, please write a comment. I would be happy to help you. If you enjoyed the video, then also consider liking and subscribing. I would extremely appreciate this. Here you will now see similar videos and I hope to see you next time.